You're listening to the Old Time Radio Show on 71K News Talk Radio. Now back to Denver's Old Time Radio History buff, John Dunning. And uh, I am very happy today to have Frank Nelson. Uh, we all know this anyway, but Frank Nelson had a frequent but indefinable role on the Benny program. He played a floor walker. Uh, that, uh, of course, in the uh, Christmas show, which they did every year. He, he, he played a waiter in restaurants, uh, in supermarkets. He played a salesman. He played a ticket seller at the railroad station. But on all of these parts, he had one common denominator and one personality trait. No matter what the situation, he was always Jack Benny's arch enemy. And that one magic word that he uttered every week uh, he always sent the audience into hysterics. Uh, Frank Nelson, are you on the phone? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're still doing that for McDonald's. <laughs> you know, I just, uh, no, I'm not just doing it for McDonald's now. I just finished doing it. Uh, I did it up until about the uh, 10th of January. And uh, the way I answered you just with the yes, you know, without stretching it or anything, I, I, I have to tell you a story about a director that came on the Benny Show at a particular point in time. And uh, so we were sitting around the table reading, and uh, Jack said, oh, Mr. Mister, and I said, yes. And uh, we went on through the thing. And when we were through and going to do the uh, rehearsal on Mike, uh, he walked up to me and he said, uh, Frank, uh, don't do that. And I said, what? He said, don't do that. I said, don't do what? He said, well, you know how you said the yes. He said, don't do that. I said, oh, all right. So get up there, and Jack said, oh, mister, mister. And I said, yes. Jack said, what are you doing? I said, well, the director told me not to do that. <laughs> and Jack turned around, and he said, have you ever seen my show or heard my show? And the director said, well, no, I haven't. He said, well, he's been doing that for 30 years. <laughs> That's what I pay him to do. It was uh, probably the the most famous one word in in certainly that I can think of in all of the old time radio I've heard. Well, it uh, it lasted for thirty eight years, so I guess it had something. Thirty eight years. Well, you must have started on it very early then. Well, I started with Jack uh, actually on June first, nineteen thirty four. I wasn't doing the yes then. I was just doing uh, parts with him and. Uh, Oh, I'd say about six months into uh, my association with him, one week I happened to stretch it, and the writers the next week said, hey, we're going to try that again. I said, try what? They said, well, you remember you stretched out a yes, and it got a laugh last week, and I had to think about it. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember. So I did, and uh, so then we would, uh, they one day decided they'd see what I could do with ooh, and so uh, they, they haven't really cued Jack in. And uh, Jack's line was, you, you really do hate me, don't you? And I said, ooh, oh, do I? <laughs> and he said, right on the floor. Right on the floor. But uh, This was in rehearsal, right? Huh? This was in rehearsal. Oh, yeah. He could also break up on the air, though. Oh, oh yeah. So he broke up many times on the air. Many times on the air. You know, it's, uh, it's uh, fun to talk to you in uh, Denver. I don't think you know this, probably, but... Uh, First broadcast I ever did was at KOA in Denver. Really? Yep, I started my career in 1926. I was still a kid in high school. And I uh, did a show for uh, the United States National Bank with a young lady by the name of Georgia Miller. And uh, she, she was the wife and I was the husband in a series. And uh, I went out to audition for it. And they looked at me and said, what are you doing out here? And I said, well, they told me they, you had something to be auditioned for. And they said, oh, well, this is a man of about 35 years of age. I said, oh, well, okay, and I started to leave, and uh, the director said, well, look, have you ever read over a microphone? I said, no, and he said, well, maybe you'd like to stay and, and read, and I said, well, yeah, sure. So I did, and there were 30 of us that auditioned that day, and the next day they called back 12, the next day they called back 4, and I got it. So I, I worked that, and uh, then I worked at uh, KFBL in Denver. I sold time and announced there. And uh, I opened Denver University's little theater uh, doing March Banks in Canada in uh, either 28 or 29. So uh, I, uh, I have a, uh, a many uh, good memories of Denver. My wife, uh, I mean, my mother uh, had a uh, dress shop, as a matter of fact, at 412 East Colfax, opposite the cathedral there. You really do uh, know Denver, then? Oh, yes, I do. Well, I may have missed it. Uh, maybe you already told me, but how did you happen to be in Denver in the first place? 
Well, I uh, I went through uh, uh, I went to Morey Junior High there, and I went to West High School there, and graduated from West. <laughs> so I lived there for a long time. Well, did, did you, you know you mentioned KOA? Don Wilson was on KOA, wasn't he? Uh, mm -hmm. Did you know him here then? Uh, no, I didn't know Don. Uh, I think Don left there a little before I did, and uh, I I don't remember Don, and I don't think we met there at all. I met him at KFI out here when I came out here. Did you read Irving Fine's book? Did I read what? Irving Fine's book on Jack Benny? No, I didn't read Irving's book. Irving is my pet hate. Is he? Yes, he is. Well, you'll probably hate this anecdote in there. He um, he he says you you got uh, the the most money for one word of any anybody in radio or television until that time. Well, that's 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 a marvelous theory that he has. <laughs> you see, Irving Irving hated like the devil to turn loose of a buck. It uh, it just hurt him terribly. Jack uh, Jack didn't, but uh, Irving did. And Jack didn't know what Irving did sometimes. Uh, for instance, I, I'll give you a story about Irving. Uh, one week, I got a call from the casting director, and uh, he said, uh, Frank, uh, I'd like to have you on the show. This, this is in the television days. So I'd like to have you on the show this week, but uh, you're just voiceover. You're at the airport, and you're just coming over the PA, and so Irving thought that maybe you'd work for half of your regular salary. And I said, tell that, and I got just about that far, and he said, Never mind, never mind. I'll call you back. So in about uh, 20 minutes, he called back and he said, uh, Okay, he said, uh, see you tomorrow and your regular salary. And he said, Now I'm going to tell you what happened. He said, Irving said, I'm not going to pay Nelson's salary to do this thing. So get another actor. So he said, I got another actor. The other actor went on stage and uh, as soon as uh, Jack said something and this fellow started to talk, Jack said, Where's Frank? And Irving says, Well, I thought he says, Where's Frank? He said, get Frank. Irving says, yes, sir. <laughs> so it ended up that he had to pay the other actor, and then he had to pay me my regular salary, so it cost him more than it would have to begin with. Well, this anecdote he reports in... It's always that way. Yeah, he, he indicates that in the book, because he, he was the Jack Benny's producer at the time, I believe. Yes, he was... Uh, originally, he was his accountant, and then he ended up being his producer, finally. And, and of I... course, he's now George Burns' manager. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think the, the anecdote... Is kind of uh, is kind of revealing because he talks in here about how he didn't want to pay your fee to come in and and do this. Basically, what they needed was the yes. You know, he didn't want to pay the fee for that, and and so he took it to uh, Benny, at least as he has it in the book. And Benny says, of course we have to pay his fee. He's entitled to get uh, his fee uh, for the one word or whatever else he he does. And and they, according to Fine, they had a big a big conference with all the writers to decide whether the one word. Uh, on this particular show was a big enough laugh to get the uh, the fee, and they went ahead and paid the fee because they decided it was. Well, I'll, I'll give you a hundred to one right now that that isn't the way it happened, because uh, if he he wouldn't have dared go to Jack and ask that, he simply wouldn't do that. Jack would expect me to be there if uh, if he if the character was in. And he cer certainly expect you to get paid for it. That's right. And uh, Jack would never have raised the uh, the issue about money in the first place with the kind of money Jack was making. It didn't make any difference. You know, what he was uh, going to pay me when you figure what he was going to pay the government, it, it just didn't make that much difference. Matter of fact, I made a lot more money on other shows than I made on the Jack Benny show. Hmm. Uh, the the revealing thing I think about that anecdote, you know, even that he would tell it, it reveals that uh, Jack Benny's character was the exact opposite of what he went to great lengths to promote on the air. But Jack was a very generous man, actually. He was a very charitable man. And uh, for instance, uh, he would he would give twenty five thousand dollars, let's say, to Jewish war relief uh, during the war, with the stipulation that there be no publicity. There was another comedian out here that would give 5000 with his stipulation. There'd be a lot of publicity. That was the difference between the two. Hmm. But uh, Jack was just that kind of a human being. He uh, And, uh, you know, when Mel was uh, in that terrible auto accident, he was in a coma for 21 days. Jack sat at his bedside all that time. This is Mel Blank. That's right. And uh, he did the same with Eddie Anderson when uh, Eddie had a stroke. He was out there at the hospital daily. He uh, was a very, very decent and uh, lovely man. He was not an easy man to know, to socialize with or anything like that. Now, Mel socialized with him a fair amount of time, but uh, I never did socialize with Jack, but uh, I certainly enjoyed working with him and I admired him as a human being. Uh, one of the things I loved about the Benny Show was how if they blew a line, they would play on it and build on it throughout the... Oh, the, yeah. Um, I was wondering if some of that wasn't... If some of those lines maybe weren't blown in dress rehearsal and built into the show or... Oh. If they were, 
No. They were actually blown on the air. That's right. Uh, for instance, uh, Mary had one where she came in and I was the soda jerk and she said, I'll have a chiss sweet sandwich. <laughs> and that, that played for weeks. And that happened <laughs> on the show. It did not happen in rehearsal. Those running gags were just fantastic. That's right. Another one was when uh, 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 Harris uh, had uh, Manischewa of it. You know, I mean, he just garbled it, and they did Manischewa of it for a long time. I'll tell you the most famous one, probably. I don't know whether it's in his book or not, but I, it probably is. Uh, Don Wilson had a line early in the show. Oh, first, I have to back up to myself. I, I had a line, uh, and Jack says, oh, Mr. Mister, I say, yes. He said, uh, are you the doorman? I said, well, who do you think I am in this uniform? Nelson, Eddie? That's the one. Uh, I'll, I'll just let you tell that. I was going to read it, but I'll let you oh, tell it. Okay, so uh, he said, uh, Nelson, Eddie, and I, uh, he said, you know, I don't like that joke for Frank. we got to get a different joke. He said, I don't like the Nelson, Eddie joke. Well, we get the show, and they haven't changed the joke. Now... Early in the show, Don Wilson had a line about Drew Pearson, the famous columnist, and it came out Greer Poussin. Well, that got a tremendous laugh out of the audience and broke Jack up. Now I look up at the booth, and the writers are motioning to me to come into the booth. So I get up and go back and walk in the booth. I said, what do you want? They said, look, when you get to the line, says, are you the doorman? Say, well, who do you think I am in this uniform, Greer Poussin? I said, come on, fellas, it doesn't even track. They said, never mind whether it tracks, do it. I said, now look, nobody ad libs with Jack, and you know that. They said, we will take the responsibility for having given you the line. I think if it had died out there, they'd have all said, he did it on his own. I don't know. But anyway, I went back out, and now we get to the thing, and Jack said, oh, Mr. Mr., and I always had my back to him, and I whirled into the mic, and I said, yes. And he said, uh, excuse me, are you the doorman? And as he said it, I saw this dull look come into his eyes like, oh, good Lord, here comes that line I don't want to hear. And I stared right into his eyes, and I said, well, who do you think I am in this uniform, Greer Poussin? <laughs> well, his eyes got like two saucers. He began to laugh. He grabbed a hold of the microphone. He slid down the microphone to the floor, pounded on the floor, got up, staggered clear across the stage to the far wall, turned around into the curtains, got a hold of the curtains, slid down the curtains, pounded on the floor some more, got up and staggered back to the mic, and the laugh is going on through this whole thing. This is all live. That's is all live. And it went on through the whole thing. Now he gets back to the microphone. I thought he'd never, you know, get back to the script. And I really think that this is probably the longest laugh we ever had on The Benny Show. Longer than your money or your life? Yeah. I think it was longer than that. I think it was, but it wasn't planned, you see. It just happened. And so... Then, uh, for weeks after that, I would run into writers from other shows, and they'd say that whole thing was a, a planned routine, wasn't it? I said, no, it was not. And I'd tell them this story very much as I've told you, and they all thought I was lying to them. I, there wasn't a one of them was convinced that I was telling them the truth, and it's absolutely the way it happened. Um, there was a wonderful one that Mary blew. In fact, I even I even said on the air, you know, I really think that was, must have been done in rehearsal, and apparently I'm wrong, but... There was a wonderful line that she blew where she was supposed to say, uh, uh, he says, where's my car? And she says, it's up on the grease rack. And she says, it's up there on the grass reek. <laughs> and uh, they used that for about three or four weeks running. I think there was, there, was, uh, there was a line in there about a couple of skunks getting out, and they're over there, uh, uh, boy, that grass reeks or something like that. <laughs> the writers were, were ingenious. At oh, yeah. Once, once anything like that happened, they would pick it up. No, Mary, you couldn't, you couldn't write that kind of a breakup for Mary because she wouldn't be able to do it. She, she just wouldn't be able to handle that kind of a thing and make it uh, sound like anything but a phony thing. No, there was never a single one of those things that was written into the script. Oh, well, we, we bounced from show to show. Of course, I did Blondie. I did my first Blondie in 1939 and did the last one on January 12th of 1950. And uh, in that, I played Herb Woodley, the next-door neighbor. Right. And uh, so we bounced from show to show. I was uh, one of the... Uh, Two announcers. I was the billboard announcer on Lux Radio Theater for two and a half years. When, when was that? Uh, well, at the beginning of uh, Lux out here. I'd have to look at my books to tell you the exact date of it, but uh, when it first came out here, I, I did the billboard announcing and then doubled into the show. And uh, just looking to see if I could pick up a date on it here, but I don't know if I can. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, while you're looking about uh, 
uh, Phil Harris, whose shows survive in such wonderful sound and, and, and are so obviously influenced by Jack Benny. Oh, sure. Well, uh, you know, he, uh, he had uh, the uh, Frankie, the, uh, the uh, banjo player, you know, was uh, supposed to be his sidekick in that. Right. And uh, he, it was patterned uh, to a great extent after what he had learned, really, with Jack. I can tell you a little story about Rochester and how he got on the Benny Show. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the only time that I ever turned Jack down in my life, I would get out of other shows. Uh, this is before I was contracted to him, and I'd get out of other shows in order to do his show. Well, he called me one week quite late, and I already had four commitments for Sunday, and I said, there's just no way I can do it. I'm sorry. What he wanted me to do was a porter on a train coming from Albuquerque. And it's a very fortunate thing that I was busy and they couldn't get me because they went out and they got a young man by the name of Eddie Anderson. And Jack was so impressed by him that he said, hey, we got to find a spot for him on the show. And he became his valet on the show. That's the way he got on the show. Maybe you almost had the role of uh, the Rochester guy. Well, the first oh, it, it, it never would have developed that way. No, uh, it would no, I mean... uh, just have been a one shot if I'd have done it. But because he had this very distinctive voice and all, Jack was so intrigued with him, he said, hey, we got to do something else beside this porter bit. Right, right. But what I mean is you almost got the role that, that uh, in other words, if you had done that show, maybe there wouldn't have been any Rochester. That's right. That is correct. Uh, I think that was around Easter 1937, wasn't it? Uh, I couldn't give you the date. I really don't remember. It, w it went back a ways, though. Yeah, long way. Elliot Lewis was another one who was who was on Benny's show a lot, wasn't he? Well, Elliot used to come on, and he did what they called the Mooley. They called him a Mooley, you're uh, kind of a uh, goofy guy, you know. <laughs> and uh, we did a routine. We did one routine uh, between Elliot and myself that uh, is turned out to be just an absolute screaming, lay funny routine, and we were scared to death of it because if it died early. You were dead because you had to go on with it. You couldn't get off of it. And what it was, uh, he gets up to the line ahead of Jack to get a ticket. And he says, I'd like a ticket for Guacamora. And I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, is that little brook still, you know, uh, how are things in Guacamora? I said, fine, fine, just fine. He says, is that little brook still running there? I said, yes, yes, it is. And we did every line of a song that way. And it just kept building, and of course, Jack doing the looks behind him. <laughs> and it went from the beginning of the song to the end with every one of the lyrics, and it played, just kept building and building and building. Then they tried it. It was so successful, they tried it again with another song about a year later, and it died a morning. And we still had to do it, because there was no way out of it, you see. Was that the Tennessee Waltz? I'm not sure. I don't remember what it was. I don't, I don't think I really want to remember what it was, because it, it just died, that's all. Josephsburg, in his book, recounts that, that, uh, that you and, uh, and I believe it was Elliot Lewis, did the Tennessee Waltz that way. Well, they, they were, then probably we did. That's probably the second one. Only the one that really played was How Are Things in Brockamora. Yeah, I think that's in Irving Fine's book. Um, uh, that's wonderful comedy when you can build something like that into. Oh, it it it, it was it was just tremendous, and it, uh, yet you can see what a chancy kind of a routine it was, because if it didn't start to play right from the beginning, you were going nowhere except downhill for a long time. Right. Fred Allen used to do some great things with uh, music. Did you ever work with him? Yes, I worked with uh, with Allen uh, when he was working with Jack uh, on about oh, I think two or three shows. Uh, where Alan was on, when they had the feud going, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's uh, What's your opinion of Fred Allen? Oh, I think he was. Uh, I think he was born like uh, twenty years too soon. Uh, the kind of comedy that he did that was so magnificent, and he was the comedian's comedian. Every comedian adored him. Thought he was the greatest thing that ever came down the pike. But he was too sharp for the people, generally speaking. And then comedy began to change, and I think he would have done very, very well on today's market or back a piece from now even. But uh, I just think he was a little before his time. You see, he never had a high rating, and yet every comedian loved him. Listen, when when you do a, a, a campaign like McDonald's, and when when uh, there you know the the tie-in to the Jack Benny show, which has been gone now for the the radio show has been gone now for 25 years. Mm -hmm. 
your your tie to that is so subtle. A whole generation of viewers is, are going to look at those spots and and probably not know what what they're doing. How how does McDonald's come up with something like that, or what? Well, uh, as as I understand it, the uh, the head of Needham Harper and Steers. Uh, you want the boring story of how I got the commercial? Sure. All right. Uh, I, I got a call one day from Afra out here. Uh, Afra called me and said uh, that they wanted me to call Chicago, Needham Harper and Steers, and talk to a lady by the name of Virginia Dalton about some McDonald's commercials. So I called her, and I said, uh, I don't understand why you don't have my phone number. I don't even have an agent anymore. And I said, I don't understand why you don't have my phone number, because I've done four commercials for you. And uh, she said, well, we're a big agency. There are four floors here, and one floor doesn't necessarily know what the other's doing. But would you be interested? And I said, yeah, sure. So about 20 minutes passed, and she called back, and she said, uh, uh, Frank, I uh, checked on those commercials. Those were voiceover. And I said, yes. She said, well, this is on camera. And then this is the way an actor sells himself. I said, what in the hell do you want with me on camera? And there was a pause, and she said, well, we thought we might. And I said, well, if you do, okay, but I can't figure out what you want with me on camera. So then on the following Monday, I uh, was called to go out into Burbank and do an audition at a small studio out there. And I went out there, walk in, and a young man, 26 years old, walks out of the back room. And he said, I'm Bill Brichter of Needham, Harper, and Steers, and I wrote the commercials. And I said, oh, I know. You're going to tell me that your mother used to carry you into the theater in her arms, and you watched me perform. And he said, no, no. He said... I know the character, and our boss is a great fan of the Benny Show. So that's supposedly where it came from. So I then did uh, the commercials, and uh, when we got all through, he said, Now, I can't go back to Chicago without autographs. And I thought, Oh, come on, you're putting me on. And so he brought these five scripts in that I had done, and I said, uh, First one he said is to so-and-so. I said, Now, who is that? He said, That's the head of Needham Harper and Steers. I said, By all means. So I autographed each of these, the people he asked me to autograph them to. And left and came home and said to my wife, there isn't a snowball of a chance in hell of my getting that job. Because any time you get all that kind of treatment, nothing happens. Three days later, they called and said they wanted me to do it. Hmm. And the funny thing is, that's the first time McDonald's has done, uh, ever done anything except real people, you know, uh, just folks doing commercials. And uh, actually, it's the biggest single campaign they have ever done. They called me two weeks into the campaign and said that McDonald's was so happy with it they were putting an additional half million into network advertising. So uh, it evidently was a very successful campaign for them, and I'm happy to have worked for them, and I got a kick out of doing it. And you're talking about the character. The very strange thing happened. You see, I wondered. I thought, now, uh, what, what are the kids going to think about this today? Uh, it's a long time uh, since my son used to come home from school and say, you know, Dad, I am sick of you, because all the kids in school were doing the yes. Okay, all the kids back doing it again. All the kids, they go into McDonald's and they say, uh, I'll, I'll have a uh, hamburger, and they say, uh, Big Mac, yes, and they're, they're all doing this bit. And I have had uh, kids run up and rap on my window, and I roll the window down, and they do the yes at me and then run. And uh, it's it's strange, but the young people have picked up on it just exactly as they did back in the Benny days. Isn't that funny? Yeah, it is. Your wife, Viola Vaughn, yep. was also on the Jack Benny show for... And she used to do a lot of femme fatales. You know, if there was a sexy uh, French girl or a sexy uh, Italian girl or whatever it happened to be. She, uh, she did a lot of those. She worked with Bob Hope a great deal. She uh, did uh, Mademoiselle Fifi with uh, Eddie Cantor, and uh, of course she hasn't uh, been working at it. Uh, I'll tell you what we do now. We have a thing that we do called uh, uh, the Golden Days of Radio, and uh, so she and I do the Pickersons now. Really? Yeah, uh, we have a lot of fun doing that. How how uh, often was she on the Benny program? Well, she used to. Sometimes she would stand by if Mary wasn't feeling too well. Mary used to paint a lot. Really. Yeah, she'd have spells when she would faint, and sometimes, boy, she'd hit that stage, and that was it. Uh, and usually, it would be after the show, right at the conclusion of the show. I don't remember Mary ever fainting during a show, but I sure remember her fainting a great many times after a show. Well, did she have mic fright? Uh, I don't know. I don't know whether it was that or just uh, a, a general nervousness or what the devil it was. I really don't know. But uh, if she was not feeling too well, they would often have Viola down there just to stand by, uh, just in case something happened to her, just to pick up and do her lines. 
But there are other times they would have her in there doing, as I say, the femme fatale type of thing. Did she, did she uh, substitute for Mary later after she left the show? No. No, she never substituted for Mary as such. Uh -huh. Now, Mary Livingston actually left the program because of the, the fact that the pressures... She wouldn't do the, she wouldn't do the television shows. She I, just wouldn't do them. She left the radio... They trapped her into doing one, but I mean, she just wouldn't do them. I believe she left the radio show, too. Well, she may have towards the end. I, I, I really don't remember that. Now, uh, Viola might know more about that than I do. She might have, the, uh, or, you know, uh, stood in for her on an occasion. I really don't know. I have said she hadn't, but I could be wrong on that. You know, we played one the other night from 1954, and uh, the actress who was playing the part was good, but there was such a difference. She didn't have that bite. And now... Mary was Mary, you know, I mean, and, uh, and when you've done a thing that long, you, you don't try to step into somebody else's shoes unless it's just a necessity, Jay. You just have to do it, that's all. Because uh, you're never going to be compared favorably. That's right. We have one more caller here. Hello, this is John Dunning here on 71 K News Talk Radio. I'd like to ask you, what was the most uh, funny or embarrassing thing that ever happened to you on radio? Good question. Did you get that? What was the... The funniest and the most embarrassing. Well, I really think that the Greer Poussin story that I told you earlier was probably the funniest. I, uh, that, that, uh, I got more of a kick out than anything uh, out of the reaction of Jack, you know. I mean, it was such a, it just broke him up so completely that I, I, I would say that's about as funny as anything that happened to me. Uh, uh, embarrassing, you. embarrassing, I don't know. Uh, that's, uh, it's embarrassing when you make a mistake. Uh, it's embarrassing when you do something on a dramatic show like I did once when I had a very dramatic scene which uh, the f first act ended with uh, you killed my boy and uh, no, you killed my son was the line mm -hmm. and I started to say boy and tried to change back and it came out you killed my soy <laughs> uh, you know that uh, that leaves you in uh, a fine state of affairs and uh, now I have to go back and do the second act and I'm thinking oh my god a highly dramatic show and I did a thing like that and then the director having no heart at all handed me a little note just as I'm going to open the second act and I flip it open and it says my little soy how have you been <laughs> And then I practically couldn't go on. I practically couldn't get the words out. <laughs> uh, you hear a lot about uh, things that happen on the air uh, in line with this caller's question, uh, where there are a lot of games played on the air. I don't know if this happened on shows like The Benny Show, where where somebody would, you would be on mic and somebody would come and jerk your pants down or such. Oh, down. we used to do that to each other all the time in the early days. Before, not on network, not on network shows, but... Uh, when I was working locally here, we used to do that all the time. Well, what is your mother would walk into the booth uh, the, naked, you know, and throw you a cue? <laughs> We're supposed to do the news now. They would throw you a cue That's naked right. from the booth? Yep. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, your most memorable experience in Denver Radio since you said you worked here. Well, I, gu I guess, yes, I did. I, uh... As I say, the first thing that I did was this show for a bank back there in which I played the husband. I was about 15, I think, and the young lady was a beautiful redhead of 32. If I had known then what I know now, I could have enjoyed the part more, I'm sure. But uh, I remember one thing that happened to me on that. I, uh, I think probably in all of my career in radio, I missed exactly one broadcast. And that didn't happen to be in Denver, but I was taken by ambulance and carried in on a stretcher while I was doing that series, and from the stretcher played uh, the husband uh, one night. Wow! And mm. uh, the other time, the one time that I actually missed a show was when I went back with Jack to New York, and I got out of bed, I had a fever of 104, I got out of bed, went down in a snowstorm and did the first show. And when he found out that I was that ill and that the doctor had allowed me to get out of bed, he was ready to kill somebody. And, of course, he would not allow me to come back and do the second show, and so the writers fought for the privilege of doing my part on the second show. And uh, that's the only show that I ever missed in my whole career in radio. Frank, we are coming up on the hour. I really have enjoyed having you on. I would love to have you back. I hate to monopolize your life, but I I've only touched on one show today, and I would like to talk about some of the other things you've done. 
And I would also like to have your wife on if that could be arranged. Well, sure. Why not? Okay. Well, thanks much for, for being with us. You betcha, John. And you let us know. I sure will. We'll uh, talk to you again. Right. Okay. That was Frank Nelson, wonderful actor from the Jack Benny Show and other programs.